Um, we start in a very relaxed, easy way. It gets increasingly more difficult and it reaches a point where I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. So if you got lost, don't worry, we are in here together. Um, it is based on a number of articles that I have produced. So it is not new, new research, but it hasn't been presented anywhere before. It was just written up and it deserves a bigger audience. It is, uh, I think, very innovating. Um, we are using Swahili, but it could, of course, be any language, any Bantu language, but any language of the world. I'm mainly talking lexicography and models, and of course, applying it to Swahili. And because we, have, we need a common language also, English and both. Okay, so uh, I will really go walk you through the basics uh, of, in the end, the corpus and, and lexicography to end up with something uh, uh, computational. Okay, so first something about, uh, well, I, I call it a background. Um, and I have numbered them. Uh, I have a, a degree in engineering, microelectronics. So for me, everything must be very structured. So 1.1, something about, uh, like I said, we start uh, very easily. We flow into it, computers and lexicography. In the recent decades, computers have revolutionized many aspects of our lives to a uh, heat heart of unseen degree. The change has not escaped lexicography, that's the field of making dictionaries, with dictionary publishers and users moving to the digital media. Dictionary users appreciate the affordances offered by digital dictionaries, which finally seem to be evolving away from their print predecessors towards innovative digital tools, embracing the new platform, let's say a smartphone. At the same time, we know it a shift, and that's important, in how users see the dictionary. It used to be, you had the Bible and the dictionary. Now, the dictionary is just a tool. If it is known at all to be working for them in the background on their handheld device. So it has lost that revert authority. Okay. Still within the same section, the fact that dictionaries are now increasingly offered and consulted in a digital format is evident, I hope to everybody here. Less evident to the uninitiated is the impact that computers have made to the very process of compiling dictionaries. It is, and it is this aspect, and more specifically the use of computer corpora. It's the only time I'll use computer corpora from now onwards, corpora. In selecting what goes in the dictionary, that we focus on in the presentation today. We do so by using an approach to dictionary user studies inspired by, how else could it be, huh? the internet era and big data approaches. By investigating patterns of dictionary lookups and a complete data set of dictionary searches by any and all users over a massive period of, well, massive, at the time, 10 years, soon we'll be able to do 20 years. We'll see why. Okay. Second section, when the background, something on text corpora and the data sources for lexicography. New lexicographic methods were made possible by the introduction of the computer into the process. The major starting point for and turning point for all of that was the COBOL project by John Sinclair, passed away a decade ago. His sister passed away uh, a year or so ago. Um, the names are perhaps known to you, John Sinclair and Sue Atkins, big names in Mexico. Okay, so what they did, they had a university, these were academics, university project, where they convinced a publisher, Collins, to make a new type of dictionary. How would they do it? they had the idea to build a corpus first. And uh, that resulted in the first corp built in 1987. <laughs> and now it looks pathetic, but they had a corpus, which they thought of, of at the time was massive of just 7.3 million words. Compare this for Lusoga, we had already 3.7. Now English, 
had that English of hold like, at some point something, and they thought it was a lot incredible, revolutionary. Okay, now we talk of Tan Tan Pokopra, which means Tan to the power of 10, and those who were at the chat GPT uh, session know that uh, the internet currently has, what, uh, a thousand billion words, mm -hmm. at least. Okay. Uh, corpus frequency was employed as a basis in deciding what to include in the dictionary and what to leave out. Mm -hmm. Given that dictionary should be useful, the assumption is that more frequent vocabulary items, uh, as evidenced by their uses attested in text, corpora, would on average be the ones to generate the most interest from dictionary users, and thus would be looked up more often than words which are rare, infrequent. You follow? Mm -hmm. Something is frequent, should be in the dictionary because it's frequent. It's not, should perhaps not be because it's so to generalize the question of interest here today, coming hour will be whether there is a positive relationship between on the one hand, the corpus frequency, and on the other hand, the frequency with which users look up certain words. Is there a correlation? If not, the whole field can go away. If yes, okay, we're on the right track, okay? Now, in online dictionaries, the frequency with which specific items are looked up by users may be estimated through the examination of what is known as server log files, which record each and every detail, well, if it's set up right, of the access to the dictionary. Third part within the background. Log files as a record of online dictionary user behavior. We've reached log files now. So what are they? How are they used? Um, a log file for an online dictionary is a machine readable, automatically generated record of the interaction of the user with the website-based dictionary. Insofar as log files hold the systematic records of the interaction between the dictionary and its user, details contained therein are a potential source of information about the consultation behavior of an online dictionary user. So the focus here will be on what the users intend to look up rather than actually the quality and the contents themselves. That's why I said it could be any dictionary. We're looking at patterns. What do users do when they use an online dictionary? In other words, the online dictionary is merely used as a catch for the study of lookup behavior. So in our case, we are dealing with two languages with very different structures. As we know, at least most of us in this room, huh? uh, the grammatical structure of Swahili is very different from that of English. And these are the two languages we deal with. And this allows also for a comparison of the results. Imagine we have similar results. What does that tell us? Perhaps about universe universalia. Okay. Fourth little block on the background. Who else has done this type of work? And of course, not alone in the field of lexicography. Although uh, the early papers were by myself and, and key members. Um, the first time this relationship was investigated, and I will actually summarize this paper as we go, was in this 2006 article by myself, David Joffe, Joffe's mother, and Sarah Hellowart, who is a researcher who's now in Canada, he used to be a student of mine at Ghent University. Uh, so we looked at a relationship between the lookup frequency and the corpus frequency. Now, that analysis, analysis back then was based on log files holding two years, just two years worth of search strings that had been entered in my online Swahili dictionary, in Swahili English. That dictionary also allows for inverse searches. We didn't really, okay, we did build an index, but you never see the index, but you can search in English because it searches the whole microstructure of all the so it's basically swahili to english 
But because you can search everything, you can also search it as if there were an English Swahili dictionary. Now, following an, uh, an earlier observation, that was our very first attempt to look at locales at the Eurolex conference in 2004. Uh, we used the Pearson correlation coefficient. Basically, yeah, you have two, two strings of, of, of variables and you want to see if they correlate. Uh, we used Pearson to basically check where is it? Yes, the top thing, lookup frequency and corpus frequency, if there is a correlation between the two. And we said back then, so it's nearly a, already 20 years ago. I'm getting really old. <laughs> uh, we said back then, uh, uh, do I say it here already? We calculated it and we computed it and we plotted the correlation at increments of 100. Okay, we'll see. I don't give away yet what we found. Okay. Now, there will be a, an intermezzo now to make sure that Tim and, uh, and, and Mr. Kanji also follow uh, something about uh, Swahili. I'm sorry for the <laughs> professional in the room. So Swahili or key Swahili in the language, keys class seven means the language of the uh, Swahili, is a Bantu language and Malcolm Guthrie once divided, uh, designed, not designed, uh, devised a system to, to basically uh, know which language we're talking about. Uh, in the Guthrie system, it's known as G42. It is spoken, if you count all types of speakers, not just mother tongue speakers. There are only a few thousand mother tongue speakers somewhere on, in Stone Town on the island of Zanzibar. But apart from that, yeah, apart from the Unguja there, you have up to 100 million speakers, even in Uganda, but only in the army. We have a it's the lingua franca. If you know it, you can travel through East Africa. Uh, spoken in Tanzania, Kenya, and uh, in the neighboring countries. Now, we we'll move to lexicography from, from that. Uh, if you look at uh, the products, the output is the result of a century and a half old craft. People copy in alphabetical order from one dictionary to the next. Uh, and it's overwhelmingly paper. The few things that exist online or that they have put are actually the word versions of say a dictionary by Tuki that they put online. It has no, you can't compare it with the dictionary, with the electronic dictionary we just saw for Lusoga with all this functionality. There's no DTD behind it. There's no big thinking, just manual work. The only one that exists electronically, but it does not, and I really mean it, it is not a great dictionary, is the one that we will be using today, right? the online dictionary that Sarah Hellerwart and I started compiling over two decades ago as a joke. It was really a joke. And she said, she wanted to research Shang. Shang is a youth language spoken in Nairobi, which is, uh, well, it has some Swahili, but lots of other inferences as well. Uh, she wanted to make a dictionary of Shang and in the process of one of Swahili. So, okay, uh, here is Telex, here is a computer. Okay, how are we going to do it? Oh, I have a new idea. Let's do it corpus-based, but not like everyone else. Let's just take all the orthographic words as is. We don't lemmatize anything. We just put them in as is. The full form with object concord, subject concord, stance markers, the whole flipping thing. That means you have a lot of repetition, if not more repetition than roots and stems. But I wanted to try out what, what would it be if we make a dish like this, which of course by definition is super user friendly. No one has to think anymore. You see a word, you can take the written word as it is, you take the orthographic form, put it in the machine, you get the meaning of it. Of course, you could say we can do this computationally. That is true. If a root is sema to speak and uh, you put this object in front uh, and this dance marker, it will need he, he said, okay, we, we understand that. Huh? Ali sema, okay, yes. You can generate it. But as every lexicographer knows, the problem of addiction, one of the main problems is that 
it gives generic answers to context specific queries. There is always a difference between the meaning you need when you need it and what is in the dictionary on a higher level. You never get a perfect mapping. So by reversing it and trying, and not to put actually a grammar into a dictionary, I hope you're following me. You have to stop me if not. By putting a kind of grammar, sorry, yeah. By not putting a grammar in your dictionary, but by actually describing what is going on in real text, you really describe that meaning. If it's too vague, you'll see examples. So I, so take a simple thing, adjective. The adjectives in the Bantu language, like Swahili, uh, you don't have many black, black. Now a black sheep and a black person, uh, they have the same root, but the prefix is different. Of course, one is in class one and the sheep, well, probably class nine. So one would be mu and perhaps the other just a nasal sound. Okay. You could say, I just put the stem black in my dictionary. It's black, black is always black. Until you look in corpus, in a corpus and the concordance lines, you see that you can't talk about a black person without offending that person in the same way as you talk about a black sheep. So the move from just a stem, apply the grammar to full words with the prefix implies that you can really get the right example with the right translation for the full word. In both cases. Is it repetitious? Yes, because you have 15 classes on average. So for each time you repeat everything 15 times. Okay. But you zoom in. You zoom in into onto the real me. Okay. So the dictionary is at its core. I, I'm going to demonstrate the dictionary as well, but first some blah blah. Eh? It's a unidirectional Swahili to English dictionary aimed at general users. We don't have anyone specific in mind with an English index, which allows visitors to search the entire microstructure and thus also to return Swahili equivalents to English searches. The dictionary is special, like I just explained, in that the macrostructure for Swahili systematically includes both. Ah, uh -huh. I had not revealed that yet. Both the lemmatized, that's lemmatized in, in, in our parlance means you have gone to the canonical form, got written of all the prefixes and suffixes and you end up with the dictionary citation form, puff, and unlemmatized, so the orthographic forms. It has both. So if someone approaches this dictionary in the traditional way, oh, I know uh -huh, Ali Sema, I know I have to go to Sema, no problem, then find it as well. So both are there. Why are both there? Because we want to link everything. You see me coming. You want to link all the forms around SEMA. Eh? So you want the root somewhere and then uh, cross references between. So an example, ah, it does. Uh, so you see, I'm not fully speaking uh, anything randomly. Uh, here is an example for SEMA. It's probably too small, so I'll do it live. If you look for SEMA, you will get actually a long list of things that follow. But let me try, but I'll have to then find the internet and share the internet. Okay, we start a tr the traditional way as to look for a route. Uh, let's start with SEMA, search, voila. SEMA is a verb, or is it here? Huh? No. What do I see? No, now I see something else. But do you see? <laughs> you you see, then we don't care about what is here. Okay. You on your screen, you on your screen see the dictionary entry. Uh, it means to speak, to say. Uh, as if you add poly, poly means to speak slowly. Sema is an imperative, it's, a, it's a rude speak. And and that's the, the novelty of, of this. Uh, the basic dictionary, and uh, you also have akasema, akisema, alisema, alias, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. So which ones did we choose to include in the dictionary? The frequent ones. For which ones did we add more info, like examples? Well, the very frequent ones. 
and so on and so on. How come they all appear when you look for sema? Well, because they all refer to the root. You see it at the end. Huh? There's a cross cross reference to root sema. Okay. Uh, now I'm looking with the interface in uh, English. If I change the interface language to Swahili, you will see most most of the material. <laughs> I'm so used to it. it's not there. Uh, is that also in um, in Swahili here at least at the bottom? If I search for the same thing in Swahili, you will see that instead of saying verb, it now says kitenzi instead of um, well, not everything has been translated. In fact, instead of noun, does it say what is Ngeli? No, Ngeli is class and Ngeli seven class seven and so on and so on. So it has been partly localized, seemingly at the time we didn't know how to say inflective verb. Like I said, it was meant as a toy. And the irony is if you now search, you Google for Swahili dictionary is the first one that comes up and still comes up because it is so pop popular. And why is it so popular? Because of this method. Now, of course, you could have typed in any of these words. I spoke about uh, Alisema, Alisema. If you don't want to parse, you don't know anything about the grammar, uh, you type it Alisema, you immediately get this article and nothing else with an example sentence for he or she said. Uh, she said that she already spoke to him. Okay, let me go back to the interface fully in English because it's a bit funny. Now we have left that dictionary on the internet. Um, we, we don't work on it anymore. We are just using or abusing it to collect data. People are using it. So it, it, to pay for uh, the cost of keeping it on our, on our server and so on, we, we have, as you can see, uh, probably on your screen, uh, advertisement. Uh, Google pays us a bit thanks to that. But basically, uh, we don't earn any money. We just want to use it to collect information on what, what people search for. That's what is interesting. Uh, we don't really develop data anymore. We don't act. Who knows one day? Huh? But right now, it is a research. Tool. That's what you have to remember. Okay, no, don't worry. I, as long as you see it, we are happy. Now, while I'm here, and I will not keep going up and down between this and the PPT, given the difficulty, so I'm going to show something I was planning to show later now. Um, Give me uh, something in Swahili. No, no, uh, sorry, not give. Uh, uh, yeah, like an. Ni te ki tu. No, no, like this. Okay. Okay, now that's interesting. People don't normally use it actually like this, but let's do it. So it's two words. There is no entry for ni pe ki tu. So what does it say? He's trying ni pe. And he's trying to, huh? the other one, Kitu, is saying that Nipo is give me and Kitu is give me a thing. In other words, it's very user friendly. In one go, it's not a machine translation. It's, it's nothing like anything fancy. Huh? This technology of 20 years ago, but you get it. No programming, just plain words. Why is it that? Because of course, this is very frequent. And I know it always works. That's why you can do live day. Most people, when they have to come up with something, give something frequent. It's automatic. You will not get something like, look for Padre Pets. I never get it. Yeah. So, um, but you can see how it works. Nipe is derived from the root pa, and you get pa as well, the verb to give or to accomplish with an example. Ting, ting has kitu, and for nouns, we of course always put in when there is a pair, the singular and the plural. Again, in a traditional dictionary, you, you would never do that. That's repetitious, but we assume, no, don't ask, require people to know any grammar. They can look for the plural or the singular and don't have to think about it. And the translations can then be, uh, when appropriate, added as well. Uh, take Bantu, it's not just person, persons, but also people. All right, so you have no other place to put people actually than under the plural. 
So we already see from the few examples that that uh, false thing, this overload also has advantages. Okay. Now I typed in a few words. There is linked to that a logging system. Uh, view query log, newest to all this. Let's try to update this. We are live. There it is, but I'm not the only one. Seemingly, this is me, Nipe Kitu. You see? But someone else is typing Kanji and Kanji. Now, guess who that is? You cannot be anonymous on the internet. We have caught you. Okay, so you normally we don't share this info, but given this is now an academic talk, I can do this. So everything is locked as you can see, and we keep track of quite a number of things, your know, IP address, um, you get, the, you get the, the second column is a, is a random code that has been generated, uh, but you can even see which browser people used, when they were there, how often they have been there. In the very early paper from 2004, from two decades ago, we did studies following users over months, tracking them, see if they learn, see if they come back, search for the same things. What do they do if they don't find the, the word and so on? User studies. Okay, this is not the topic of today, but actually very interesting. We were the first to you know, try that out. And that was for Northern Sutu in, uh, in language from Bantu language from South Africa. Okay, so you can see everything is locked and has been locked since 2003. So we are reaching 20 years. So we are at 20 years, so I'll have to write the paper this year, 20 years. Okay, good. Animal, for now, stop this share. Who knows, we come back and try to go back to my um, slideshow, uh, which I hope is this one. Let's see if we get there. What do we now see? Do, do we have this also yeah. shared with the people at home? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so the slides, will probably say a few things that I've just demonstrated live as well. Huh? So if you, for example, look up that one over there, that one over there. So position three, demonstrative yeah? uh, in a Bantu language, in the online English to Swahili index, uh, you get this output. You get typically the stem, that one over there, with all its forms. So in a traditional dictionary, you only have le. In our dictionary, you have ule, lule, ule, dule, wale. And we are convinced, you can already see it from the homonym numbers, that is very useful because, of course, such short words have different uh, similar looking words that are not these types, uh, sorry, not these uh, word classes for different parts of speech. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's always kionyeshi, uh, so they're not similar. But a demonstrative for, uh, position tree, that's what it says. Within position tree, because in a Bantu language, you have three positions. I'm talking to these two, not all the others, of course. Um, and then the class system, four and nine has E in front, five has E in front, three and 11, U, and so on and so on. So again, this is grammar brought into the dictionary on purpose to make it super user friendly. People love it, users love it. That's why Google has put us on top of searches for 20 years now. Looking at, for example, ule, now the opposite of full form in the same dictionary, eh? you get ule, and then the info that it is related to the stem, le. So yes, there is a repetition, but in the process you teach. If you didn't know what ule was, you can yeah, basically derive it from this info. If you so wish, if you're only interested in the meaning, you stop there, most people want a quick answer and they, they move on. Huh? Say you're looking at uh, Yakaisha and then they stopped in the online Swahili to English dictionary, you get something that is not in the dictionary. Why? At the time it wasn't frequent. So what we did add is a bit of morphological decomposition. Frequent concatenations of prefixes are in it and the stems as well. And then for something like Yakaisha, which has no entry, it still tries to decompose. Yaka means Isha. How come we don't see the rest? Yaka. Ah, oh, yeah, it is there. Sorry. Yaka is here. 
and each is here. So and so you can put the two together and then they and and so on. Mm -hmm. So, but again, there is no module, grammatical module, and this is just lexical analysis that we do. Okay, if you look up I love chicken, uh, I love chicken, of course, is not an entry in any dictionary, but be uh, because I and love and chicken are in it, you bring everything together and then you get me and you have the thing that, uh, but you don't have the chicken or do we? No, we don't, uh, but uh, it, it tries to give you mimic machine translation before there was uh, this possibility for Bantu languages. And lastly, look up Jambo. Uh, you hear it all the time when you travel around Jambo, which actually should be Hujambo and Sijambo. Uh, because of the way it is linked, you get the full forms as well. Okay. Now, one of the, apart from doing usage research and tracking users and building profiles and adapting your dictionary. That's a totally different dream of mine that I've talked and written about. One of the questions has always been, okay, we write these big books. We've just gotten another big book. What will you use the dictionary for? As a door stopper? No, I'm not joking. The question is, how much of all that material, 800 pages, do people actually get to see? Because if 50% is never seen, you should not write that 50%. Okay, setting aside the question, which 50%? But do people actually get to see all the words ever? Well, in an online dictionary, you can test this. And 10 years ago, uh, these were the graphs. Um, if people have looked up 100,000 words, let's first look at the blue, and we already at 65% of the dictionary that has been seen over time. But if people look up up to half a million words altogether, of course, well, you have any reach, what does it feel? That's about 85%. And if you include the cross references, that the blue line, well, you can see that very soon, and it's of course asymptotic, you will reach 100%. Conclusion, it's not just a door stopping. Luckily for us, luckily for you, in the end, each, and that's very important, and then an in, insight we didn't have before the digital world. In the end, each, words of a dictionary is seen, is looked up, is searched, if you use the digital terminology. Uh, look up as paper, search the digital. Word. Of course, not with the same frequencies, and that's what it is now. Huh? That's the topic of today. So frequencies now. Okay. This is an example of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, so it's fine, yes. These are the top ranks in a corpus. So the most frequent word in the Swahili corpus, of course, is always function words. They're always short. It's like in any language for English is a uh and the. So for Swahili, it is na, ya, wa. So na is with. Nya and wa are two con uh, even qua or um, connectives. Tatika, zani, and so on and so forth. Ranks in the corpus. So you would like to see also high ranks in lookup frequency. Is that true? Well, rank one here, people, it's the second most looked up word. No, can you imagine? Rank number two, the sixth, rank number three, and so on and so on. So, okay, at first sight, there seems to be a correlation between rank in a corpus and lookup frequency. Okay, if theoretically now, Imagine it would be one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, and so on. Perfect. You put this in a graph, what do you get? Mr. Kanji, what is it that you get? Straight line, yes? Now, if there is a bit of variation, what do you get? A, a cloud, huh? fine. So my assumption was, if I do this for my dictionary, Swahili, I will get a cloud around the 45 degree line Sadly, this is what I got. A very famous graph. It has been quoted many times. When you get knock. Unless you zoom in. And here, there is, we'll get there. Let's quickly look at English. Perhaps it's better there. Uh, the, of, and, to, uh, and so on. English frequency ranks. It's not as beautiful as for Swahili. Huh? Luckily, huh? People don't look up the and of and and in English, but they do. I mean, who needs that? 
It's shocking. The 12th most frequent lookup in an English dictionary is the. It seems to be a very difficult word, the. It is. If you listen to some people, they cannot use it right. Huh? Depending on your language, it's actually very difficult. Sorry? You say for you, it's also difficult. Uh, yeah. So depending on your background, these are, it's not that easy. Okay. Now, the graph for English looks as bad. Now, the late Adam Kilgariff, when he saw this, and he commented on this before he died, uh, he said, we can't do anything with this. This use, this all this research of yours is totally useless. But you see, what? 10 years later, I still bring it up because we continue to. So at the time, what we tried to do, there was an article from 2006, as you saw. We tried to, to, to prove that, come on, there is, there is some correlation. There must be. Otherwise, we can kick the field. So what we did is we, we calculated the Pearson correlation coefficient. One is very good, zero is no, no correlation. So at the push, it's, it's, it's horrible, but at the push you could say, okay, there's some correlation up to the first, what is it? The, fir the first few ranks, then it becomes what? Even negative, so a little. For the, the, few, the few first items, there is a correlation. Like we saw for Swahili, ni and wa and ya and kwa and so then that's the equivalent for English. Uh, same pattern, but uh, also not higher than 0.3. So what does that tell us? Um, we reported back then, low positive correlation values up to corpus frequencies, uh, or corpus ranks rather, because this is ranks, up to 3000 for Swahili, up to 5000 for English. So that's the that big graph, the, the little beginning and the rest. There's no way to predict anything. Now, this finding is interpreted, was interpreted to mean that as far as predicting user usage, corpus derived frequencies are only of limited use for the very first few thousand. If that is true, which we claimed back then is true, such an interpretation would put into question the rationale or corpus-based methodology of identifying potential dictionary lama. So such a negative finding, we talked about negative findings in the previous talk as well, eh? uh, would appear to deal a rather serious blow to a central tenet of the mainstream corpus-based methodology characterizing much of modern lexicography and not only lexicography and LP applications and so on. Eh? So it needed further investigation. Now, we stopped there. We claimed it. We like to shock. We always have titles that make people wake up. And we stopped there. Now, a team in Germany uh, around Koplenik, and then another team, um, Caroline Muller Spitzer, uh, they looked at our data and they said, well, let's try to do better. They did it for German. And they said, ah, it's not true. There is a correlation. Um, the authors argue that the correlation coefficient that, that we used uh, to look at the relationship actually distorts the picture, since it assumes a linear re relationship between the variables, which is not realistic, they said. Why? Uh, in any set of data listing word occurrences or lookups, there will be a long tail of very many rare events and then even hypoxes. So using that formula, Pearson is wrong. That was their claim. They tried a different approach and they proved that there is a correlation. Um, these studies and subsequently another one, um, what they did was to simulate dictionaries rather than to look at real dictionaries. Basically, they let a million monkeys work and a computer program 
tried out things, and then they proved, you see, there is a correlation. So what we did in the end is to say, because you see, I'll, I like to shock, but I'm also not afraid to say I was wrong. I even say sometimes, I don't know. You know that joke, that once you get a PhD, there are two things you never say. You never ever say, I don't know. And you never ever admit that you were wrong. Hmm? But I easily do. So in the end, I invited the Germans to say, okay, here's my Swahili data. In the meantime, it's 10 years of data. Let's try your methods on real data and see where we can. And that's what I'm presenting now, because indeed I was wrong, okay? But I'm happy to say, because that's research. Um, so we're going to replicate the German, let's call it the German method on the log files, but this time spanning 10 years. So here is the study. Block number two, the study. 2.1, the research questions. These are twofold. One, it's in big, the air con fell out. To what extent does corpus frequency predict dictionary lookup frequency? And two, is, I was wrong, it's a new engine style. Is the predictive power, so the corpus frequency predicting lookup frequency, language universal? That's why having two languages and comparing the, the graphs in the end uh, is interesting. Okay, so how do we go about it? Well, we have this Swahili English online dictionary. You saw it is a very basic dictionary. And remember, it is at least initially only meant as a research tool for us. We can play with it. We never ever meant to make a serious dictionary, even though I know people like Kun Bostun, Marta Vos, they all have installed that dictionary on their laptop. Why? Because it's so easy. And I'm, I'm, I feel very bad that everyone looks at me, his dictionary, and I say, well, I don't even know Fahidi. I know nothing. I'm just a lexicographer, okay? So remember that it is not a serious dictionary. It's just a concept that we tried out. Okay. Now, over the first 10 years, this dictionary has undergone a number of changes because it's a toy for us to, to change parameters and see what happens. Yeah? Ever more data was added. Uh, at some point, we, 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 we allowed sentence searches, like yeah? we started with the phrase two words, and we started allowing that. We had morphological decomposition, we saw it. Uh, we then also saw lots and lots of misspellings, like people don't know how to spell foreign. That's a difficult word in English. If you see that many times, you start rerouting it automatically to the right one, like Spellchecker does. The, the, the substitutions and so on and so on that they use to automatically suggest the correct form of a misspelled word. So we started adding uh, a bit of technology like this to help people. Uh, we added Google, I said why. Uh, we took off, that may uh, sound strange, the feedback form. We had an official feedback form so that people could talk to us, but I reached a point where I didn't want to answer mails every day anymore, so we took it off. People use it or don't use it. I don't want to know. We just look at the logs. We made a downloadable dictionary, which sounds very well. It's incredible. Like I said, seemingly more or less everyone who deals with Swahili has that dictionary. Um, and somewhere midway, we replaced the two search boxes. You may have noticed, perhaps not. Initially, we had two search boxes, one for English, one for Swahili. We replaced it, and currently it's just one. This is an, ex an experiment. And we did this after five years. So for five years, we have two boxes, and for the next five, only one. And we discovered something amazing, which I will share with you. Then, unfortunately, the locks have been unavailable for a number of periods, and the locks, uh, not the locks, the locks, yes, they show that the dictionary has been stolen once, and and uh, we also had an attempted theft the second time. You can see that from the logs through time, that's 10 years of usages. Of course, a peak like this is not normal. That is someone who managed to steal the entire dictionary. You just write a script and try everything out, and you bring everything in. Now, after that, uh, we changed 
the system so that after a certain number, you just get cut, cut off. So here they started and we know who it is because we saw the locks and we blocked that person. Now, ironically, two weeks after they did that, they came to me and they wrote a kind of email. By the way, shall we cooperate? I mean, we would like your data. You can guess what I answered after I saw this. You don't try to steal and then come and ask for it. But yes, you're never, but you know that. Yeah? What we said 20 years ago, you're never anonymous on the internet. Yeah? I warn every, every one of my students of the dangers of Facebook and soon of, of AI, of course. But yeah. We know it's so easy to wreck. We've just seen it. It's so easy to see who is using your dictionary because it is every person who uses the dictionary that in their own name in the beginning. It is shocking. And I'm not using, new, using this example now to, to, to bluff. It is true. People say hello. Hello. They greet the dictionary. And then they put their name in the dictionary. So we say, thank you. Thank you. We have everything we need. We don't need your ID anymore. We can pretend in the articles that we use, uh, you know, we have hidden the IP address and so on, but actually we know everything. And Google knows everything as Amazon does and all the others. But you know that. But I also, and we knew it 20 years ago already, we, we have seen it over and over. Just remember. Okay, the study, third block. Form and content now of the server logs. You've seen the server logs, so that will go a bit quicker. Huh? We have, of course, this, uh, uh, Okay, in which language are you browsing? That gives us idea if it's a mother tongue speaker of Swahili or English. Hmm? Of course, it's approximate. Uh, the look at types, we have different types. Uh, in which section, basically, of the dictionary were they? The reverse side, so English or not. Um, we have info on, uh, obviously, the IP address, the host name lookup, the term itself they looked for, or more than just the term. Uh, the number of times. Uh, of the number of hits, rather, they, they get for each term a timestamp, date stamp, site ID, and the user agent string. And then in the article, we will claim, and it's true, but it's not very useful that we, we hide a number of these things and we don't use them. But it's like Google saying they hide it when you, re you request it, but of course, they never delete anything, they keep it. Okay, cool. now the logs themselves. Uh, first 10 years of logs, 30 million searches, halfway already mentioned that we changed the number of search boxes. Now that gives you a problem. If you only have one search box, how do you see whether they are looking for Swahili or English? Well, luckily for these two languages, um, they are different enough to be able to say it's either Swahili or English, there are very few words where they actually overlap. Then of course there are personal names that could be anything. Huh? But um, what we do in the end was, was um, to use frequencies. If it overlaps, the corpus in which it is more frequent than the other, we assume that it is in that language that they looked, that they wanted to look it up. I'll come back to that later. And I'll prove, but I already say now that was the right decision. Uh, that's what it said. So I can go. Okay. Um, then, for, to, to make it manageable, at least at the time, we did not include multi word searches in this study. And indeed, we say here, and it is true, the IP addresses were replaced by non identifying numbers in order to be uh, in accordance with the GPR. Huh? This uh, GDPR, yes, this uh, to protect everyone's identity. Fifth block, corpus frequency lists. Okay, for Swahili, we use the 22 million corpus. Uh, currently, it stands up double that, um, which has about half a million types, and so unique orthographic forms. Most of it comes from the internet, including some books that we had scanned at the time. I think we saw in the meantime that we have far more than 50 books. We have a big library. I think I showed it to you when you were in Ghent. We have a whole archive, thousands of Swahili books now. No? Now for English, it's much easier. We just talked to the people behind the sketch engine and uh, 
we got uh, the top 200,000 unlamatized forms. Unlamatized because the Swahili one is also built like this. So we wanted to compare apples with apples and not apples with oranges. An M1010 12 corpus extracted from that. Okay. What's the analysis and the results? First block, we prepared the data. We followed the method of our German colleagues. Eh? Uh, we introduced a concept known as requests per 1 million requests. It's a trick to normalize per million. Okay. And then you divide it in big categories, not like I try to do rank one, rank two, all the way to the end, but first just three big, sorry, big categories. Something is either, either regularly um, in the data, frequently or very frequently. Okay. Look, uh, what is then the data for Swahili to English searches? Um, so you have there the regularly ones, the frequently ones, and the very frequently uh, looked up ones. Well, if you just look at the red, that's the conclusion. 86% of all the search searches in that picture uh, have been searched less than half a time per million, so once per two million. So most of the dictionary is very infrequently used and a small section very frequently. Tip, typical Zipfian distribution. Now, to answer our question, uh, if frequent words are also often searched for, we did a number of tests. Huh? Um, you first look at the actual opus occurrences versus the dictionary searches, and then we try to visualize that. Now, if you do this for the three most frequent words in Swahili, you already know them, na, ya, and wa, in a bigger corpus. Uh, uh, the translations are there, and a lot of blah, blah. So top three in the corpus, what's this, the rank in lookup terms? Two, three, six. Beautiful map, mapping for the top. Do we do the same for English? No. So what am I showing here? E, na, but E is of course not Swahili, it's English I, but that has something to do with people just grabbing any box and typing. That's the, one of the reasons we changed from two boxes to one. We noticed that people actually just use the first box as a search box and rarely went to the second box. So at the top we had Swahili and you had as a top word I, which of course is English I, so um, I'm running ahead, but what am I showing here? Wait, the most search for Swahili word, it's not Swahili, in terms of, in terms of our Swahili corpus, we know it's frequency, frequency per million, the rank in the corpus is 513 only, yes, but for Na it is rank one, and for Ya it is rank four, also beautiful method. Now, if you look at regularly, and that was the top, the top, it's a beautiful map. But if you look, now look at regularly and frequently, and here's our few words in Swahili, mitaku, ya, jama, tutu, and piki. Uh, basically, the, and I didn't put anything in red, it's because you can't say much about it. It's, you can't predict where they'll end up. Um, and also for, what was the previous one? Yeah, that is both regularly and frequently. And the next one is just regularly, same thing. Swaziland, Yakwamba, Vilo, which is actually a typo. Uh, if you look at the corpency ranks, it's 11,000, 99,000, 20,000. So it's all over the place. So if you look at it on this level, like we tried in the earlier study, you don't get anything out of it. That is why you move to these rough bins, three big groups. So once beyond the top ranks, comparisons on the level of the individual words are not very meaningful. That's what we just said. You need a simple visual, visualization. These are the, that's the way we do it. Corpus frequency and the searches. So something that is very high, very frequent in the corpus, is it also searched for very often? Yes. 
something that has n frequency in the corpus, n frequent two times. So what you want is that the yellow goes down and the red goes down. So if you see it in three groups, clearly on this level, there is a correlation. Not for the orange, it's the middle group, that's the problematic group, but for very frequent and very infrequent, there is this correlation. So if you now want to fine tune this model, uh, you, you employ a strategy whereby incremental virtual dictionaries can be created. Virtual dictionaries, you, you, pretend, you pretend that you're building a dictionary uh, by putting in words that you know people look up or the opposite, the, not the words that people look up, we'll get to it, yeah? but yeah, virtual dictionaries, you, you mimic the searches. Um, let's see. I didn't put anything in that. I didn't put, let me move, 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 move. That's dangerous. I, I need to go to this. No, I'll walk you through it. Um, let's see. So if corpus frequency were unrelated to search frequency, the number of entries included in a virtual dictionary should have no effect on the proportion of words that are searched for either regularly, frequently, or very frequently. If, however, corpus frequency and search frequency were indeed related, we would expect higher inclusion rates of each of these categories for a virtual dictionary, including a smaller number of these items. With a greater number of lower ones, fewer words should be searched for in each of these categories. And this seems to be the case. For example, perhaps that's easier than the blah, blah. As long as only the top 50 search requests from the corpus frequency list are included, all these entries are searched for both regularly, free, well, you can't use both uh, because it's three, regularly, frequently, and very frequently. Even for the top thousand corpus ranks, the figures are still high. 100% of all the entries are searched regularly, 99% frequently, 92% very frequently. However, as more corpus frequency ranks are included, these frequencies go down and they start deviating from one another. So for example, at 30,000 search requests in terms of corpus frequency, and you get to 75, 58, 26. And that is the graph now that shows it. So if you make a dictionary that includes only, let's say, 10 words, and there are the 10 top frequent ones, well, 100% of them will be searched for. If we have a dictionary of the, 10, the top 10,000, what will be searched for regularly? Most of it, very frequently, less, and then in between for the frequently. That's what you see. So the bigger your virtual dictionary becomes, uh, the, the lower this percentage of entry search for becomes. Yeah, you still with me? Okay. So such a declining pattern is in sharp contrast to randomly sampled dictionaries of varying sizes. So this was, you put in your dictionary of 100, the top 100 in your dictionary of 1,000, the top 1,000, the dictionary of 10,000, the top 10,000. Imagine, virtual dictionary, you make a dictionary by randomly sampling words. A dictionary of 500 words, 500 random words, meaning with a random frequency. I really showed the same graph. This is what you get with a random dictionary. Where do you use 10, 5,000, 200? Your percentage of search for, it's incredible. Eh? It's a straight line. Very frequent, very frequently search for. If your dictionary is random, is what? 5% throughout, no matter the size, of course, it's random, no matter the size of your dictionary. This is an important graph for the conclusion. Okay. 
there is a variation of this to, to of, of this idea of using virtual dictionaries. And actually they got the idea by, by one of the things I wrote once I said, corpus frequencies do not predict lookup behavior beyond the top few thousand words of a language. That was my conclusion, right? That big graph where you could see nothing, only at the, this little corner you had perhaps correlation. That's why I said that. Well, they tested it to test this hypothesis with our data. We excluded the top 5,000. Okay, we got rid of this. With the only place where there was correlation, we throw it out. And even the top 10,000 in the new test. And let's see now what we get. Well, um, so you create two types of virtual dictionaries. A dictionary that consists of the next 5,000, you turn out the first 5,000, and one of 10,000 if you throw out the first 10,000. So if corpus frequency were unrelated to the frequency beyond the top few thousands, rank-based and random-based should perform equally well. And this is clearly not the case. The next graph will show it. Dictionaries based on frequency perform clearly better than the randomly sampled ones. And this holds for the frequency search uh, uh, all types of uh, these three banks. Here we go. If you exclude the top 5,000 and you look at the next 5,000, yeah, if your dictionary for the next 5,000 still uses the next top 5,000, the percentage of terms goes to 70. If it is random, you barely reach 15%. This orange is for frequently. The very frequent ones okay, are this shaded section. Same for 10,000. Right? If you think, exclude the top 10,000, yeah, you're left with rank number 10,001, 10,002. So a uh, really infrequent words, but still, if what becomes next, the next 10,000? Are the really in rank with next 10,000? The dictionary covers still what is this 50%, but if it's random, it's even worse. It's there, it's just about 10%. Very important graphs. So clearly, you can see there must be a correlation. Now, this was for Swahili to English. We quickly run through the English to Swahili. We have it. Not because we have an English to Swahili dictionary, we don't, but people search for English words. So whether they get something or not, it's none of our concern. They wanted them, they look for these words. So we, like I said, we trick them. Just, we catch, well, we don't need to be the big Oxford English dictionary to have data. I don't know, they also look, I hope, I don't know what they do with their data, but we can look at actual data through Swahili. It's always nice if, you know, from a minority position, you go and talk to the big guys. At least that's how we have to feel and speak like this to keep believing in our field. Okay, so this is a similar graph now for English to Swahili. 75%, uh, much lower, 75% search for less than twice per minute. No, once per two million or half a time per million. Now we go through the same things again, test one, two, and three. And so um, look at the top three frequent words, the and, and two. It's not one, two, three this time, 10, 43, seven. Again, luckily people don't look for these words too often in the dictionary, uh, who wants and them two. But they are not used, easy to use, eh? preposition like two and phrasal verbs. So perhaps there's a reason for that seven. Um, in the reverse, you find you, I, and love, and you see the frequencies apart from love, which doesn't have a good rank. There's a good match. But again, this is typical for online dictionaries. People put in these platitudes. They look for the root words. They look for obscene words. They look for um, things like love. So that is why it is frequent in the corpus, sorry, in the lookups, but not in the corpus, or less frequent in the corpus. But when you move from very frequent to this middle ground, again, you got things like photo, lately, bun, motherland. You look at the frequency, 60, sorry, the ranks, 
60,045, now I do, there's no, there doesn't seem to be a correlation. Uh, we go even further down, same thing, you don't see uh, patterns. So let's move. Uh, we had a graph like this for Swahili. The graph, the similar graph with the rough bends for English is really convincing because it's a mirror image. The yellow is really a mirror from the red. So there it's clearly, no doubt there is a correlation. And then when you move, then you start fine tuning with your virtual dictionaries. There's the equivalent graph for English. Looks very similar. Now the English one, when, um, let me go immediately to the answer, when it's random, again, beautiful straight lines. So we're moving to something that looks universal, but the level of the straight right, sorry, straight line, the percentage is different across the languages, coming back to that. So uh, the last test was where you do have this uh, blockage view where, where you throw out the top 5,000 or the top 10,000 and look at whether the next 5,000, whether it is based on rank or random has an impact. Uh, and again, just as for the Swahili, for the English, you see exactly the same. You don't have to reread it, the same patterns. Okay, what does that mean? Um, before we, we actually try to wrap it up, I've, I've said a few times, you have these two boxes that became one, uh, which gave a little extra, very interesting piece of research. So halfway through the project back then, uh, two became one search box. The initial idea was to simplify the, uh, to streamline it for the dictionary user, because we saw, that's really the main reason, we saw that people just chose the first box, typed in anything, and hope to get the reply. And back then, if you typed in English and the Swahili, you got nothing. So it was very annoying for us to see all these English words in the Swahili list. At the, and David Joffrey didn't even ask me at that point, he's, he just changed it. He made it one box without consulting me. So in the beginning, I was not happy. I said, but what, what will happen to our data now? We, we can't compare the before and the after realistically, but it became something very interesting. Um, so there are very few words like kite, kite in English. Uh, Kite in English, kite in Swahili, for passion, grief, kite, the thing you fly. There are very few words like this that are, are orthographically the same, but there are. So we use that method of looking at uh, relative frequencies in the two languages to decide which one to show, the Swahili one or the English one from the single box. That's what I just said. No, 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 no. What is that? Okay. So trying to look at the overlap now. Um, let me read that again. For our lookup analysis, this meant that we had to come to choose how to go about deciding on the intended language, hmm? if you only have one box. When an item could be both Swahili and English. We opted to use a simple heuristic to do so. An item that is both found in both Corpus frequency list is assigned to the language for which the normalized frequency for that item is the highest. That already said. We can now also study how well this strategy worked. Okay, so we undertook a study for the overlap between all the types in our 22 million Swahili corpus and the 200,000 top types from the N1010 corpus. It turned out that there were 17,890 types. Looks a lot, of course. Huh? But we're talking big data. Huh? It's half a million, half a million types. Huh? So of those half a million, seventeen thousand appear both in, or pretend to appear both in English and Swahili. So we actually went manually through this to have a gold standard in the end. Uh, Ninety-four percent. Um, 
uh, after checking it, uh, we, we noticed that 94% of those that uh, had to be English were correctly as assigned by the her heuristic in the end. For the Swahili, it is 99% even. Then we have a category others, which uh, includes proper names, abbreviations, place names, other languages, typos, junk, really, really junk. So actually things that could belong to any. So if you don't include that, our decision to use relative frequencies was correct in 94% of the cases. So this is an excellent match. So future research don't have to repeat that, at least those who map Swahili and English. Um, the gold standards also gives us an insight into the value of the use of two separate search boxes, one per language versus the single combined search. Mm. We'll explain this to you. Altogether, 90% of the overlap entries were searched for. 96% of the overlap entries were searched for. 80% of the times in the Swahili box, 86% of the time in the English box, 93 in the combined box. Okay, that's comparing the earlier with the new one. Now, focusing on the Swahili search box, just 7% of the Swahili items were looked up solely in that box, while as many as 92% were searched for in both of the boxes. Similar, that's like an old clock. What is that? Oh, that's beautiful. That is at the end of the class, that's the bell. Uh, oh, like a clock in Europe. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, bottom line of all this uh, paper, not paperwork, all these uh, little bullets is, Dictionary users simply opted for the most readily available box being the one at the top of the page. And that's why so much English ended up in the Swahili box and never the reverse. You hardly find any Swahili in the English box. Now, especially if you look at the following data, looking at the top 50 of the English items looked up in the Swahili box only. So these are English words that were only found in the Swahili box. One can wonder why anyone would think that these are Swahili words and here are these eh, ranked, not ranked, but ordered from most frequent to least frequently looked for. So servers, unions, formats, rankings. More, more. I mean, who would in their right mind think this is Swahili, but all these were very frequently found in the search box, in the Swahili search box, etc., etc., etc. Interesting, many plurals. Eh? People, so you, you think people know how to use a dictionary, but they look for plurals. Now, meta lexicographically speaking, uh, this, this feature may be seen as the digital equivalent of what Rufus House called a, a single amalgamated central list. Think of Afrikaans and Dutch instead of having. Uh, an Afrikaans, Dutch, and on the other side, the Dutch Afrikaans dictionary. No, they make one lemma list, they amalgamate, because there are so many of forms that orthographically correspond between Afrikaans and English, they just try to make one long macro structure. And then basically, instead of saying what it is, say what the differences are. In Afrikaans, this is like this, unlike the Dutch, which is the opposite of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes the same as well, of course. Um, so we concluded and we are convinced that uh, one box is better than two boxes. And this is shocking because it is against, at least a mathematician or a scientist would like, we want order, we want logic, but people don't want that. That's why Google actually only had for a very long time, just one box, not nothing else just a box. 
So actually we could say we reinvented the wheel, but then from a scientific lexicographic point of view, right, we try to force people, if you want to look into this side of the dictionary, do that. If you want the other side, do something else. No, the search engines, engines were right all along. One box for everything. Japanese, Chinese, Dutch, English, French, one box, just start typing. Uh, you could have started with, you know, choose your language first and then you start typing kanji and here's your help file. And for this character in Vietnamese, do this and for Nodo Sud, do that. No, one box. If you anagram, then they know what, which language you want. That's it. So we found it out. But it's interesting that, uh, lexicographically speaking, we have this data now. So it was never meant, it was an accident, an accident, as I explained, that it came about, that suddenly we had one box. But uh, we did some research on, on graphical user interface, actually, yeah? how to design a good working tool. It's a nice uh, thing that we discovered on the site. Okay, so if we now bring everything together, concluding part, um, using, on the one hand, words actually looked up in a decade's worth of blogs of Swahili, respect, respectively English, in a real world online Swahili English dictionary. On the other hand, actual and word occurrences for uh, these two languages, as found in large corpora, we propose two sets of simulations hmm, to settle the debate as to whether or not there is any correlation that words people actually search for versus what people actually speak and write as reflected in corpora. Both our testing approaches revealed a clear positive relationship between corpus frequency and search frequency. Items that occur more often in a corpus are also looked up more often in a dictionary. And even more significant, significant items that appear less often in a corpus are also looked up less often in a dictionary after all. And this is very important. Uh, it proves that this, this invention, this revolution since Cobalt uh, was the right one. And to base corpora on frequency is the right choice and the only way to proceed. Because especially that last line, eh? items that appear less often in corpus are less frequently used, looked up. Eh? So there is no need for them. So you must really cover, if you have a desktop, desktop dictionary of 50,000 entries, you must really make sure these are the top 50,000. And not start saying, oh, but this is an infrequent word they might use, may want. This is all advertisement, blah, blah. No, they want frequent stuff. It's not because the Russians uh, sent out Sputnik today that quickly you have to stop the press at Merriam Webster and include Sputnik in your dictionary. No, it's infrequent still. But they did that with our data. And the effect is evident in both Swahili and English. So our first approach was an entry lookup simulation. The idea being to include incrementally more items in a dictionary from the top of a frequency list and to note how many of them are looked up either regularly, frequently, or very frequently. This analysis demonstrated that as one digs deeper into the frequency list, apparently ever more of the not so popular items are also looked up. Now, blah, blah. when the same exercise is repeated with dictionary entries included randomly, rather than based on the top ranks in the corpus, the proportion of items looked up, these three categories again, remains virtually constant. So if you make a dictionary randomly, you achieve nothing. And you see, and this is important because many dictionaries for African languages, to bring it back to us now, are random approaches. We go into the field and we just happen to collect what we collect. There is no, okay, sometimes there's a method, I have to be careful, eh? if you use an ontology, there is a method at least, but in the end, these terms are random. And there are dictionaries, I remember in South Africa where I worked for over a year, there are even uh, dictionaries where in the introduction they say, well, you see, whether something is in my dictionary or not, it's accidental. If it's missing, it's just because I 
didn't stumble upon the word. He, someone, Sneiman, I remember from Northern Sutu, wrote this in his preface of his dictionary. If it's missing, I just happen not to have seen it. And that's a problem. Our dictionaries are random. In other words, the use of them is one of those straight lines, which are what? 20, 30% of what people need. Reformulated. There is no effect. What was it again? Uh, yes. Um, no effect whatsoever of dictionary size on lookup success when one, one is just pulling random dictionary samples of varying sizes from a corpus. So it has implications for field work if we link it back. That's why we always go to the field work, you know, frequency is corpus, corpus, corpus. So with regard to the issue of the point at which the corpus frequency is no longer helpful, as I have hypothesized, to be around three or four, uh, 3,000, 5,000, eh? and uh, the new batch of simulated tests consisting in discarding the top demonstrated that corpus frequency continues to exert a positive effect. Mm -hmm. It was actually a nice trick from my colleagues from Germany to say, let's get rid of the top and see what happens with the rest. We still have an effect. Beautiful thinking of them. The rank based dictionaries uh, exhibit clearly better coverage than random dictionaries. Reformulated in order to boost lookup success for words looked up less frequently in a dictionary, the best way to select those lesser frequent entries remains those based on corpora. Because I remember a discussion with Adam Kilberry, who's the big name in, in corpus studies. Uh, once, once you reach a certain point, you can't use the corpus anymore. No, it remains useful. So, although the various results for Swahili and English turn out to be comparable, to a point even rather similar, you would say, they are not identical. Indeed, take the, uh, uh, the first set of simulations, the fact that lookup success rather remains constant in dictionaries, in dictionaries for which the lemmas have been randomly selected, is actually a stunning outcome. And those graphs where it is a straight line when it is random. Because look at the baseline for Swahili, for regularly looked at material, it is 30%. Frequently, 17. Very frequently, just five. English is better, 45, 28, 10. But what does that now mean, those numbers? This is a fantastic insight. Take English. Ah, no, that's the case. Swahili. The baseline for regularly looked up material is 30%. A randomly compiled dictionary, in other words, will never be worse than 30%. You cannot go below that. So from the moment you, you, you do your best, from the moment you put in some logic, some thinking, some frequency, this 30% will go up. You will never have a dictionary that is as bad as 20% for Swahili, for the regularly looked up material. It's fantastic. You have a bottom and you cannot go below that. And that's a new insight. These baselines are language dependent. Each, each language works differently. It has different morphologies and so on. So, and in our case, we saw it is much better for English than it is for Swahili. Of course it is, of course it is. Think of an English verb, it has four forms. An English noun, ha, I'm sorry, an English adjective has three and an English noun has two. Try that for a Bantu verb, we are in the hundreds uh, and so on. Okay, so, huh? so of course it is better for English, but still we have discovered this experimentally. With real, and that's the nice thing, with real data attached to a toy dictionary, but still as useful as, as if it were a perfect dictionary. We claim that this is a direct result of the different morphological structure of the words in Swahili. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what I just said. 
Now, these values also give us the absolute minimal lookup success rates for online dictionaries. That's what I said. You cannot go through that button. That's why I put it in bold. It's one of the nicest things that came out of it. It is literally, literally simply impossible to go worse or to do worse. Uh, one, when one bases the selection of the Lamata on corpus frequencies, one improves the success rate, always. And the graphs also indicate that while the improvements are substantial for the high and the mid frequent corpus stems, the bigger the dictionary becomes, the smaller the improvements. Okay, that's always the tail, I know. Um, and finally, for very huge dictionaries, one may assume one reaches a point where there is no further on improvement to speak of, but someone should do that study. I, for Swahili, definitely we don't have enough data to really test this. I think we, we will need the sizes of these new tools, uh, dictionaries of hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of entries to see, is there a breaking point? And then, um, Finally, um, when we take this bird's eye view, we uncovered relationships that seem to be strikingly similar, despite the dramatic differences in the morphological type of the languages involved. Uh, in other words, these languages, uh, English and Swahili, this time in red, from two different language families behave quite alike in terms of corpus frequencies, predicting lookup frequencies. A predictive power that may very well be language universal as a result. And then this is clearly, we think, an important finding. And then there are a few references, but the most important one is this one from 2006. And the other one, because it's basically recounting the story in a new way. And then that's the latest one we revisited the earlier one. So I have to thank. Uh, because anyway, they are, of course, co-presenters. Uh, I have to thank David Joffrey, Tuta Joffrey, that's his mother, Sarah Hellowat, and also here, Sasha Wolfer and Robert Lapp, especially the last two really, really helped because it was big thinking. But yes, I was wrong. I don't feel bad about it because I learned a lot doing this research and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Jeff. Copyrighted the list of entries. So I own this particular A to Z list because, like for the Swahili, we did a trick. Zule has a tradition of lemmatizing stamps. So they go to the smallest possible form and then they give you an extra compendium, a very uh, hard to get through grammar to make words. Result, the dictionaries of Doc and Villacasi and colleagues are not used, cannot be used. I know no Zulu linguist who doesn't have to look up a noun in class nine twice. They try here, they try there. So I said, stop. I want to sell dictionaries in, my, in the townships. Soweto. I'm going to look at the frequent words of Zulu and I'm going to lemmatize the orthographic forms like we saw for Swahili, except, I didn't go that far, except for the verb. But all the other word classes, you know, something like 15, all of them, full words, nouns, full words, adjectives, full words, relatives, full words, demonstratives, full words. Uh, video phones, of course, huh? that's uh, non-brainer. But and people declared me crazy because that means Zulu has pre-prefixes that the alphabetic categories are huge. So what? It's not because no one has done it and you have a tradition of 150 years that you cannot break with tradition. And now my Zulu and the uh, Vita for Cosa, my dictionaries are the most popular and most useful because they can be used. People can look up the words as they find them. No more thinking, what sh where should I cut? Just go straight to the word as you saw it written. And so what the toy of Swahili a few years later was actually implemented on a serious level in a real dictionary, really corpus driven. 
So in my Zulu dictionary, as you know, 5,000, 5,000, it's really the top 5,000 orthographic words from my corpus. And then I calculated that corresponds to 70% of all the, all the tokens in the corpus. So I know with my little dictionary, well, it's 620 pages, 12 signatures, 26, that little uh, booklet, you cover 70% of the Zulu language. Okay, I don't cover the other 30%. Yeah, you would need a much bigger multi-volume thing perhaps, but so by using a, a corpus and sticking to the corpus, and describing at each level the 70% of what you see in your corpus, you know that you've covered that. What people will most need will be in the diction. I fully agree. You had no other ways. I remember before we met, okay, I can say that before we met, we met. You wrote to me, like many people that wrote to me. Yes, I, I discovered your paper and uh, I want to build the corpus. And I have 5,000 words in my corpus. <laughs> so I think I was very rude and I said, you mean uh, 5,000 types already then? And so your corpus is 10 times bigger at least? No, 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 no. All the words, one next to the other, 5,000. I think that was it. I didn't communicate anymore with you. So, but I had to say, of course, you have to see where you come from, right? Oral. You're the first one to start putting it on paper. So clearly I was arrogant there. Like I had to disregard this because being in South Africa with all the books for Zulu and Sutu and Vanda and Tsonga, you know, you could move and dig in and build corpora. They have the Bible. So the whole Bible is already a million words. So it went fast. But uh, yes. Um, I have colleagues, as you know, yeah, uh, Jacques van Kermelen, um, who was one of the supervisors of my PhD, he even then wrote articles on purpose and the title, a non-corpus based approach. <laughs> because when he goes into the field to collect the dialects of Flanders, he does not use a corpus. He has an ontology, much like the dictionaries. And it goes from man to the animal world, to the plant world, and so on and so on and so on to cover fields. So I agree and I admit there are other ways, but probably given my background, I like to count, I like distributions, I like graphs. So I need to quantify. So for me, anything you do, I want to digitize as fast as possible and run a script over it so that we start. Huh? But I agree, if you start from scratch, there's no corpus. You have to start with a Swadesh list. You have to start doing palatography first to understand the sound and so on, yes. So they're not competitors. They're actually, huh? yeah. But as you've seen, I hope over the years now, huh? yeah. you, you start building a corpus. Huh? Yeah. And, and then that, that allows you to do that. Now you can do serious yeah. linguistic studies even once you, that we didn't touch, we didn't touch corpus linguistics. It was only lexicography, but one of the things you do once you have a corpus as a linguist is corpus linguistics. And if you want to make money, we did it. You sell your data, basically. I remember they wanted to do text prediction for Zulu and a Canadian company wanted me to to basically give them frequencies of orthographic words so that when people type in Zulu, yeah, the next word is predicted. They need the data. We had the data, we sold the data. When Google started on, on Swahili machine translation, they wanted bilingual corpora long ago. Now they do everything themselves. They bought our data. So it's the, this approach using corpora, yeah, we focused on lexicography, but it's it's major main building block of everything we use these days. So if we want our languages, eh, we already concluded in the previous talk that at least for Uganda, there's nothing we can do to in our lifetime to to move the languages upward. But 
what we can do is, is uh, through the big data companies, make tools that they will want to use. And they don't even know that they're using dictionaries. They don't even know that there is a machine translation involved or this chat GPT do, doing thing, things for them in the background. They will just be playing around with the tool. That's where we probably can make an impact making sure that our minority languages are put on the map. Forget the government word. But, huh? What? Yeah. But it may be because of my background that I say this, but, well, we try both. That's why uh, working together from different angles helps. Eh? We try both, eh? but, uh, Language politics is tough. Politics is tough. Mm -hmm. um, big data is also tough, of course, because we are a very small player. Yeah, yeah, of course. What we saw is only possible online or in a digital format. You cannot print. It's like Wikipedia. You've reached a point where you cannot, it would be absurd to print it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I think I said it from the beginning when we went slowly. These are things that are now possible thanks to the, going digital. We go digital, we explore things, we get answers to age old questions like which percentage of my victory gets to be seen in the end, everything we now know. Yeah? And, 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 and we also create new questions because of this new digital format. Yeah? But given the future is digital, in the long run, even for Africa, and they, they all have a toy, um, there is still hope. I th I'm, I think both of us are still positive. That's why we continue in the field. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the at face value, at the, at the facts and the struggles we have to go through, we are actually mad to continue to believe in it. Yeah? Unless you say it's just for me, I have to because I'm paid to do it. Yeah? If that is the attitude, it's my job, I do it. I go to the field because someone said I have to. Right, and I write a report and then I got more money. I can go again. That's, it's possible that is actually the only thing that drives us to do it. But I don't have the impression. I think many of us really do it because they believe it helps humanity forward. And uh, eh, it's a big word now, but at least those people Climb the ladder. We had a question, I think, from in the chat. Let me open the chat. Eh? Uh, if there is a question, it was a question. Can we ask a question? Um, are we allowed to ask questions from here? If I recall correctly, from the presentation, multi-word searches were not studied in the project. That's correct. Is this, no, if this is the case, any specific reason why? Oh yes, because computationally it would just have uh, become a much, much bigger project. You also have to think, what do you do with the multi-word? Uh, shall we now parse it and put each of the parts under the, uh, as if they were looked up separately or treat them as a whole, like an N-word, a two-word string, a three-word string, a four-word string, and how far do you go with that? So we felt, uh, well, it's already 30 pages in the written out version, so it was long enough, but, I'd like to see someone tackle uh, the, for bigger language uh, a study of, of the multi words. Yes. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, thank uh, uh, all of you, actually, uh, because you're all part of the team uh, for the invitation uh, to share. Basically, we each chose a topic to give a kind of overview and documentation. And in my case, dictionaries, uh, corpus-based dictionaries. We just picked one uh, uh, because we are in the Swahili environment here. But uh, this is what are really our hobby works. But if you come to the other talks, you will see that uh, as a lexicographer, I, I do also <laughs> many other different, very different things. Mm -hmm. um, this is really applied uh, lexicography. But although applied, but it became, you know, it's more on a meta level. Yeah? It's about thinking about how we go about uh, our work. But I can confirm that, that there was quite some uh, 
talking in meta lexicography, there was quite some discussion in the academic literature. Uh, the Schreiber and his team wrote this, ooh, ooh, what shall we do with it? Because if it's true, it's a big problem. And, and people didn't really see an angle to, to rebuttal it. So for some years, I was happy, but also unhappy because you're in the field. You want to believe that you're doing the right thing, but you have just disproven it. It was difficult. So I'm happy that we found a way out that we are back on track. Yeah. Data, data frequencies remains important. Not just to sell ads next to your emails and so on, but eh, really for, for making sure the tools work and are as user-friendly as possible. Mm -hmm.